Well, thanks, J.O., and uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, first out, I want to acknowledge the tragic events that unfolded at Bondi Junction on Saturday in Sydney. It's hard to comprehend what's transpired. There's many people hurting at the moment now. Thoughts are with those families and victims who are affected, including the family of Ashley Good, daughter of former North Melbourne player and club director Kerry Good. I know everyone across the football family will join the North Melbourne Football Club in offering our condolences to all impacted by Saturday's attack particularly Ashley's partner, Daniel Flanagan, Kerry and Dion, Ashley's mother, Denise, and Ashley's extended family and friends. And I also want to acknowledge the hurt that um, the Sydney Football, the Sydney Swans Football Club will be feeling today. And I think both clubs will be looking at how they acknowledge those events next weekend. On the good side of things, it's been a great start to the footy season marked by uh, some great footy, uh, wonderful crowds, first ever opening round, played in New South Wales and Queensland. Round one was the largest attended round in the game's history. And last weekend before last, obviously the state of South Australia excelled in hosting another gather round, which was spectacular. And I hope many in this room and, and, and people watching had an opportunity to attend or will have an opportunity in the future. Uh, as an AFL Commission, we want to thank our supporters who are coming to games in record numbers, uh, committing to uh, big club memberships, and we want to thank players and clubs for all they're doing to engage with our fans. And the next week, actually we've got a great round of fixtures this weekend, and then the week after we've obviously got the Anzac Day round, which will be uh, a great round of footy and also an important time for us to acknowledge the greats who have built the game into what it is today. Which leads me to why Jason's with us today. So on behalf of the AFL Commission, it's my great pleasure to announce today that at our most recent Commission meeting in Sydney last month, the next legend of the game was confirmed. I can announce that Jason Dunstall will be elevated to legend status at the Hall of Fame induction this year in Melbourne on June the 18th. Congratulations, Jason. <laughs> so, Jason, many of you know this, but I'll repeat it. Um, is just one of six players in BFL, AFL history uh, to have kicked more than a thousand goals. He's 1,254 goals, sitting third on the all-time list behind only fellow legends, Tony Lockett and Gordon Coventry. He was a four-time premiership player for Hawthorne, four-time club fairest and best, three-time Coleman medalist, and 12-time leading goal kicker at the Hawks. Across his 269 games for Hawthorne, he averaged just under 4.7 goals a game, and he kicked double figures in 16 separate games with his 17 goals against Richmond at Waverley in 1992, the second highest tally in a BFL AFL game ever. Across all senior football in our game's history, the great goal kickers of the past, Coventry, Lockett and Coleman and names in other states like Robertson, Naylor and Farmer have brought people through the gates to watch their feats. Jason Dunn still sits easily amongst the very greatest players in our history. He had, looking at you now, he had incredible speed off the mark, <laughs> had a wonderful set of hands, highly accurate kick, and was the focal point for the great Hawthorne side uh, in his era in the, in the 1980s. By any measure, Jason is a legend of our game. We look forward to elevating him in front of the greats of the game later this year. But we want the football community to be able to celebrate his enormous contribution through this season uh, without actually asking him to keep this great secret for a few months. Uh, and we also want football fans to be able to uh, thank him and acknowledge everything he's given to the game in the, in the months ahead before we elevate him on the 18th of June. 
will announce the other inductees in June, in, Duke, in June. But Jason, congratulations. Thank you for the countless highlights you've given to footy and everything you do for our great game. Thank well, you, Richard. <laughs> Uh, I guess I'd just say I'm, um, I'm a little overwhelmed at the moment. It's, uh, it's an incredible privilege. I um, feel very humbled, um, almost to the point of embarrassment um, when you consider there's you know, just, just a tick over 30 legends in the game. Um, it's the highest honour you can imagine, so I, um, I feel incredibly grateful to the AFL. It's been a, a massive part of my life, and to sit amongst names that are synonymous with the game now, um, as I said, in, incredibly humbled. Jason, how was the news broken to you and what was your first reaction? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I, had a, I was doing a game in Sydney at the SCG and I had a missed call from Richard. And I was um, sitting next to Sarah Jones and said, a missed call from Richard Goethe here. And the person who said, oh, Chiefy, you're a legend. And I, I said, Sarah, come on. And I rang him back and he actually confirmed it. And uh, I, then she said, are you a legend? I said, no, I was just chatting to him about something else. And I'm so glad we've brought it out because I'm not a good liar. <laughs> to have to lie for, this, you know, for a couple of months wouldn't be great. So, uh, but I was, I was absolutely thrilled. And then um, uh, I had a chat to Patrick Keane, and um, it was yeah, it, it was a really good moment. How significant a moment is this in your your life, your football life? Uh, well, I'm not getting any younger, so I'm glad it happened and didn't have to happen posthumously. Okay? <laughs> uh, but no, um, look, I've been I've been blessed to play for a great club at, at the right time and, and had a lot of success. This is just something that it's, it's like, I don't know, I've been, love being part of the AFL. It's, it's basically given me a life that I never dreamt of. Um, and to have this honour bestowed upon me is just uh, top of the dream. Joe, um, I mean, obviously, in, you know, tonight, etc., and uh, come June 18th, there will be a lot of highlights played in your career, and there's plenty of them. But I guess a lot of people would be unaware or even forgetful of the fact that you had a horrific injury. Um, that, that nasty head knock at the time. How close was it first to you as a football? Um, well, they tell me there's two layers of bone on the skull, and, and I only fractured the first one. It's, if you fracture both of them, you're then in trouble. I like to think that's responsible for the hair loss, Tony, and the skull being <laughs> a bit numb. I don't know, but um, I think I missed eight or nine weeks at the time, and the surgeon wouldn't let me play without a helmet, which was um, much to the mirth of my teammates and opposition alike. But no, look, that's one thing. I, I think we're a lot more aware of things now than we were 40 years ago. Um, so we, all we wanted to do was play the game back then. So it didn't really matter what the injury was. You just, whatever it took to get over it, and then you'd want to get back out there. But I think we're probably a little bit more mindful of um, repercussions and, and the way we, we look at players' management now um, that it might have been a bigger discussion had it happened today rather than back when it did. You obviously. You obviously the one out there doing all the deeds, but is there someone, one person more responsible for what you've achieved beyond yourself that you, you want to pay tribute to? No, just me, David. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, look, I, I was at the end of the production line at all. I mean, when you're full forward and you've got all these great players further afield that, that continue to pump the ball down to you and, and some classy players. So I, I always defer to my teammates. Um, I was blessed to be on the receiving end of, um, you know, some of the most skillful players that have ever played the game. Had great support from family and friends, so it's um, yeah, it, it's it's always been a, a, anything you achieve is a team achievement. No, so I'm sure the premiership the highlight overall, but apart from those, is there any is there any one achievement or one moment or one memory that, that might not be not not really great? I think we we play for premierships. That's that's why players play the game. Um, you speak to anyone, and they can have all the individual honours in the world, but I bet you they swap them for a premiership if they don't have one. That's, that's the ultimate success, that's what the game's played for and that's, that's, that's how we remember the great teams and, and all any player wants to do is be a part of the great team. What would be the advice you'd give to the younger Jason Dunstall when he first walked into the rooms at Glen Perry? Um, be a better athlete before you got here. <laughs> Maybe work on your endurance a little bit. But I was lucky, um, we, you know, we never ran up and down the ground the way they do now. Uh, it's, it's such a different game and I, I, don't, I still like the game. Um, we were just having a chat before. I, I said, whilst the game's changed a lot, the basic premise of it for me hasn't. There are still some great games to watch and still some that I think I've just wasted a couple of hours of my time. I mean, that's, that's forever and a day the way it's going to be. It's, it's a fantastic sport. Um, just, you just enjoy the ride while you can.
Yeah. You said before, Jason, that you're embarrassed by this, but how can you be with that glittery, sparkling CV? Because we talk about the names that are in there, Sarah, honestly. And then all of a sudden you sit there and go, well, really? I'm going to be amongst those people? Um, when you just got to do something that you loved, uh, I was lucky enough to get to do it for 14 years when I played, that was just, you know, I, I was high on life at the time. Um, you just never think you're going to end up in a position like this. So it's, uh, it may be embarrassing, it's not the right word, but I, I feel a little, a hint, a hint embarrassed. Jay, so when Alan James inducted Gary Ayers into the Hall of Fame, it was a beautiful speech. What do you, what do you reckon Yaddy would say on this occasion? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah he'd, he'd, he'd lean back and go, hey, <laughs> hey, little boy from Queensland. <laughs> no, he used to work me hard. He knew I was coming from a long way back fitness-wise. We used to do extra running sessions on weekends of pre-season, running up and down the ramps at Sandringham, which was down where he lived. God, that was a, not good for me. Um, but he was, he was like a father figure to a lot of players and certainly was to me as well. So very grateful. It's a, it's a shame he's not around. Um, we'd love to share it with him, but very grateful for his contributions. Uh, Richard, on a, on a minor note, in the light of last week's news, um, has there been or will there be any consideration to Carl Kikichu's uh, place in the Hall of Fame? Sorry, I missed, missed it. There was a camera clicking. Just say again. Uh, last week's news about Carl Kikichu, okay. was that prompted any uh, thought about his place in the Hall of Fame? Well, we only found out about it on Friday. There's a court process that will play out. Obviously, we made amendments last year. Uh, at a commission level to how we deal with circumstances like that when there is um, a finding. Uh, so we'll wait. We'll wait for this process, court process to unfold and then we'll determine if there's any actions. Uh, Richard, typically we appoint the legend or the inductee on the night. Could you just take us through the rest of the decision to get this out today and um, celebrate it a little early? Yeah, it, actually I'll go back to um, when I rang, when Jason rang me back and I said, you know, um, what was, what, what the commission had, uh, had determined, I got about a three word response from him, which was, oh yeah, thanks. And that, <laughs> so I knew, he, I knew he must have been with some media colleagues at the time. Uh, I, I, for two reasons. I, I think it's really important as a game we celebrate um, something like an elevation of a legend, an elevation of Jason Dunstall to legend status in the Hall of Fame. I think we should take the opportunity to celebrate that. Uh, and also I think it's pretty tough uh, for someone who's in the media like Jason to sort of keep this under the hat for, for months and months. So I reckon for, for two reasons, but most importantly to celebrate what he's done and to do to, to move that away from the night, which will be a, an amazing celebration and there'll be some, um, some great Hall of Famers announced on June 18 as well. But I, I just think this is special and it deserves its own special place. Looking, looking forward to getting up there for 15 minutes on Hall of Fame night. <laughs> not really. Okay. Um, hopefully it'll be uh, an interview style sort of thing. Uh, again, it's not easy talking about yourself, so we'll see how it goes on the night. Right. Jason, for the age old question, how, how do you think you would go on tonight's game? I wouldn't get through pre-season. <laughs> <laughs> to be brutally frank, um, I don't know if I'd be a good enough athlete, honestly. But you kind, of, you kind of think if you were brought up in a different time, you're probably a di physiologically a, a little different and, and better prepared to come into the game because they have such a great pathway into the game now, which wasn't really in existence um, back in the 80s. Um, so, so, look, maybe, maybe, but I don't know where I play because I'm too small to play key, I'm too small to play midfield. <laughs> I'd be a pocket or a flank, I think. So, Richard, what's the process? Who determines who inducts Jason in terms of going through his career? Uh, it, yeah, so Patrick Keane sort of, who and, and the great historians in the AFL sort of talk to various people and so that'll all be, it, it'll be a great night. Richard, there's still a lot of um, confusion among footy fans in regards to the suspension that was handed out to Jeremy Finlayson last week and the penalty that was handed out to Alistair Clarkson in the pre-season. Can you, in your own words, explain to footy fans the differences in the oh, I, don't, I don't think there's a difference in the sense that I think the AFL has taken a very strong stance on that issue and that stance um, is the most important thing uh, and uh, we will look at the penalty in, 
you know, hopefully this never happens again. If it does happen again, we'll look at the appropriate penalty under the circumstances. I think both both penalties are um, were a very strong signal from the AFL that there's no um, place in our game for those sort of actions. Um, speaking of federal medal year, Richard, Ben Cousins is always one that comes up around this time of the year talking about potential inductions. Will he be in consideration this year given what he's achieved in the game and what he's been able to do in the last couple of years? I, I won't talk about Hall of Fame. I will say um, it is a joy to see Ben in the shape he's in right now and I've seen a fair bit of him in, in the West and um, he, and so that, I think that's fantastic. Uh, what I would say with Hall of Fame and it's almost my precursor to our Hall of Fame committee discussions each year is it's not who's in, it's, it's who's not in. <laughs> it's an incredibly high bar to be a Hall of Famer in the AFL and it's even higher to be a legend. So, um, you know, uh, we'll look at those things in due course. Jason, um, Sam Mitchell said bring your mouth guard this week at Hawthorne. I'd be remiss if it's not to get your take on the Hawks and where they're at. What do you make of their current situation? Do you think that's, there's a place for them in the modern game around um, to bring your mouth guards and back up at training during the week? Yeah, I suspect it doesn't happen very often these days. Um, I mean, they have such a demanding schedule. Um, and, and you need your best players out on the track all the time, so you can't you can't afford them being injured at training. But every now and then, a wake up call doesn't hurt. I don't think. Um, we chatted about it before as well. I did the the Port Frio game Saturday night, so I didn't see the Hawthorne game. Uh, I would normally go home and watch it, but when I saw the score, I thought that's a bit depressing. I'm, I mightn't watch this one. But um, look, if, if Mitch needs to give him a wake up call, fair enough. I mean, we all know. Um, what they're trying to do and the direction they're heading, but it's it's hard when you're down the bottom to lift yourself up now. Um, you know, clubs have spoken about priority picks for years, but the, an extra pick of the draft doesn't turn things around. It's a long process and it takes a lot of work, and uh, they're getting to work. But when that happens, um, you know, it could be a year, it could be three, it could be five years. You just don't know. Was there ever um, an opportunity to go down the coaching path yourself? I mean, didn't have the patience, Tone. Honestly, um, yeah, seriously, I. <laughs> Uh, I helped out once I'd finished for a few years with um, Judgy and Swabby at the time who were coaching, but uh, just a, a little taste of it was enough for me. I, I couldn't do that all the time. And sometimes um, it's nice to sit back and, and watch without that emotional involvement. I mean, I'm still obviously emotionally involved as in a Hawthorne Football Club supporter through and through, but just not to have some skin in the game is nice. Um, and I've been involved with the club for a long time and then did Ten years on the board, so um, it's nice to sit back and actually now just be a supporter and watch. Um, but I, I, I couldn't live the life of a coach. There's, it's too intense, and, and they watch so much footy that would drive me nuts. I think. Jason, the race to thirteen hundred was great as a footy fan. Yep. With, do you ever look back and go, "Geez, I wish I played another season"? Or oh, absolutely, I do. <laughs> uh, we, we were so, Plugger and I had a, a very healthy rivalry, a great competitiveness, and. Um, it's, look, I, I had a couple of knees at the end and my body was just done. I was, I wanted to beat him badly, make no mistake about that. I mean, you, the first thing you do, because back when I played, everyone played on a Saturday afternoon. And you'd have a good day, you might have kicked seven or eight and you'd come off the ground and you'd go, oh, what was the St Kilda score? Oh, they got beaten by 80 points and, you know, they only scored 70 points themselves. The trouble is, Plugger kicked 10 of their 11. <laughs> and you'd actually lose ground, thinking I might have actually made some ground on him. But it, oh, he was just too good. He was too good. But, uh, I think we had a good, um, a good crop of full forwards at the time that motivated and, and, and pushed each other along. You said you're bad at keeping secrets. Just tell me people knew about this. Uh, I've told my two brothers, and that's it. Well done. Great. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.